So before I start, I want to echo exactly what Tommy just said. I'm going to, I'm going to show you all something real quick. I had to plan to uh, until he did his presentation before I jump into mine. Because he makes a very good point. Um, This is what I want to show. When we talk about pivot uniformity, talk about um, <clears throat> system performance, and like I said, I didn't plan to put this in here, but the fact what Tommy covered, so do some of y'all see what's going on in that field first off? Do we see a green band going around that field towards the external and then there about midway down that pivot? So what's that assumed to be? Probably a leak in one of my sprinklers. The inverse of that, there's, it's easier to see in some of these yield maps here, same field. Um, the other thing we see here is a yellow band between the two green bands, probably a stopped up nozzle. Um, same thing here, we see that yellow band out in the field where there's a stopped up nozzle or a leak problem in that pivot. Um, and this one may be a little harder to see, but this on a peanut yield map I created during my PhD at Oklahoma State, we're uh, testing some prototypes, but you notice that there's a big red band there. What happened here, and the reason that's striped, there were two harvesters out in the field, so only one of them had the yield monitor on it. So what that red band that you see is going on there, the farmer knew immediately uh, his nozzle package had been flipped when it was installed. So it was almost a whole span that caused that. So the point is with that, those two or three slides is um, it's extremely important when we start talking about using advanced technologies and incorporating advanced practices into irrigation management that our pivots up to par. You know, we've got a lot of guys in Georgia, I don't know how many guys you've got here that are really interested in doing chemigation and fertigation through a pivot. But if we've got problems like that, they're showing up on a yield map, that means that we're not ready to move any more advanced, right? If we're not doing a good job managing just the water in general, then we're not ready to take this advanced technology to the next step. So, um, <clears throat> you know, a lot of, the, I'm going to skip this for time's sake, you know, a lot of this Tommy kind of covered and talked about it, but there's a bunch of things that you want to, you want to consider before you just step into irrigation. This is my basic slide. So, irrigation efficiency, really quick, what type of irrigation are you using? Soil water holding capacity, discuss that, we've got different types of soil. Crop growth stage, you know, where are we at on that growth curve he talked about. Um, split apply those weekly rates that he's, uh, you know, exactly like Tommy said, try not to go out in one application. And then utilize sensors for more precise estimation. All right, irrigation cost, this comes from, uh, this comes from Georgia. So I'm not sure how, how close it is for y'all. Um, I, I would assume it's probably pretty close. So, um, I updated this number just the other day. Actually, I thought I updated. It didn't upload. It didn't upload the updated version. I apologize for that. Right now, we are sitting at uh, at about seven dollars actually for electric in Georgia, and we're sitting at about ten dollars and eighty cent. I rounded that up to eleven, and so that comes out of an average of uh, about nine dollars here. So change that to about nine or about ninety thousand dollars for ten inches of irrigation applied. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind that, you know, it's not free to pump the water. We're paying for the energy costs. That's where we're at, no matter where we're moving that water from. So when we look at uh, trying to maximize profit, sometimes we don't see differences in yields, but that can be good if we're able to conserve water a little more. All right, so this is a, a deep, busy, busy slide. I don't, I don't expect you to read it. This is what I call kind of a test question just to get you thinking. Um, looking at soil types, and I just, um, I pulled a soil type from South Georgia and it's just kind of a sandy loam soil there. But basically a sandy loam soil um, has a soil water holding capacity in the range of 0.8 to 1 inch per foot. Anybody can find this data off NRCS Web Soil Survey. That's where I pulled that data from. So you pull it up for your farm. It has an infiltration rate of 1 inch per hour here. And then we've assumed at this point in the year the crop's relatively young, but we have a rooting depth of about 12 inches. So I said that we had a um, basically a summer thunderstorm that came up that had a 1.5 inch per hour intensity and lasted for two hours. Meaning we checked that rain gauge that Tommy has out in the field and we caught three inches in it. How much of that, it was mentioned in one of the earlier sessions, how much of that is actually effective? Right, so I go through here just kind of a simplified version of what's effective there. So first off, in two hours worth of rainfall, we've got an infiltration rate of an inch per hour. Over two hours, we can only get two inches of that in. 
So immediately we've lost an inch of that right off the top. Then if we're assuming that we've got 12 inch rooting depth, that means that we're only able to hold, and I use the one inch per foot there, we're only able to hold one inch of water per foot of soil. Does that make sense to everyone? So if we're sitting there with a bucket of soil, per foot of depth in that bucket, we can only hold one inch worth of water in there. And so when we look at that with a crop that can only access 12 inches of that or one foot rooting depth, that means that we're only able to catch about an inch of that water. Does that make sense to everyone? How we look at that, we can't add three inches into that. We gotta look at a fact that it works the same way with irrigation, what we're getting back to that crop. All right, system performance. Tommy touched on this. This is, again, I'm starting with basics. That's where we have to get basics right. So how many of y'all, you know, when you're riding around and see stuff like this, right? Everywhere. All right, so that goes back to my yield map. We could create that yield map. We're gonna have that perfect green band right around through there, right? So same way here, I was, I apologize for the quality. I probably should have just pulled over, but I was driving down the road. There's leaks all along this pivot. And then a big problem we have in Georgia, you see the pavement right there. You know what's going on right there, right? Car wash. Car wash, that's right. But what does that do to us in ag? It's nice to clean the mud off, but, um, there's some, there's some bad legislative issues that come up from that. I'm sure y'all probably have something similar in the Mid-South throughout the states here, but this is our fact sheet that we have. It's called Evaluate and Interpreting Application Uniformity of Center Pivot Ar Irrigation Systems. This is exactly what uh, Chris Henry's been doing on Tommy's farm, basically setting those systems out and checking. I didn't go through the uh, in-depth portion of it. So what you want to keep in mind when we're looking at it, that your application rate along the length of a pivot should go up. Anybody want to take a guess at why that is? You're not allowed to answer. Okay. You're a dealer. That, that's cheating. Anybody besides Tommy or Chris in the room? Why? Why will my application rate be higher but my debt be the same? It's moving it's faster. Moving faster. Right. right. It's moving faster out there. And what's it also doing out there? Covering a lot more acres, right? So we got to make sure we have higher application rate out here. And we, how do we set that? What's causing that to happen? Nozzles, right? The orifices inside of those nozzles. We make sure that sprinkler package is set up right. Just like I just showed you earlier, if we inverse two of these towers, we perhaps have too low a flow rate further back in, right? That's what we picked up on that yield map that day. So we're looking for a uniform application depth, not a uniform application rate. Our application rate should increase as we go towards the end of that pivot. So keep that in mind. All right, Tommy already talked about this. Corn's a pretty high water using crop. Um, range is around 22, 28 inches of water per season. And then, so just to do some math, if we put 22 inches of water on that crop, that's not irrigation, don't, not even though we've done that in Georgia. Um, 22 inches in a particular season, we get a 200 bushel per acre yield. That's 3,000 gallons per bushel to create that. That kind of puts it in perspective. That's, that's a lot of water to create that crop, right? All right, irrigation scheduling. Um, I'm down to, I've got about 10 minutes left before we need to get y'all out of here. But I want to uh, touch on this really quick. Um, I'm, I apologize, I don't have all the, um, I was in Mississippi right before Christmas, so I added it, but I don't have all the Delta states. What I see is we're pretty consistent. What I don't like is we're pretty consistent for visible stress, right? Um, Tommy talked about filling of the soil or kicking the dirt. So I've heard two or three different methods on that. I like the shovel method. I was somewhere one time, shovel method, what the guy did, he, he took a shovel full of dirt, and I don't know if y'all did this, and he slowly tipped it up, and depending on where that dirt slid off that shovel, he decided where to irrigate. That's new. Huh? That's new. That's new? That's a new one here? I mean, I think it kind of works, but my problem with, with that, or my problem with fill of the soil, I like to use these probes like Tommy's showing to get a visible, a visible representation of where my soil moisture is, what a rainfall or particular irrigation event's done for you. So as you look down that profile and what he's showing you there, you see where the moisture's penetrating, see where your moisture's at. But I've yet to find out, I don't know if anybody's yet to find out how, how sensitive your fingertips are on actually feeling where you need to trigger that soil type, right? So that's where the feel of the soil to me falls apart. I like, I keep a soil probe in my work truck at all times. There's one, if you go out to it in the parking lot, there's one or two of them sitting in there. That lets me see what the soil looks like, but I can't come out of your farm and tell you when to trigger your irrigation based on looking at that. I, I'm not that good. My fingertips are not that good when it comes to it, and I, and I doubt there's many of y'all in here. I can tell you if it's saturated. I can tell you if it's dry, but that in-between level that he's showing you on those graphs, that's really hard to find. That's a pretty finite amount. Um, pretty low on soil moisture sensors. You gave some impressive numbers this morning, though, here, it sounded like, uh, for Arkansas at least. Uh, Mississippi, about... 11 percent, 7, 10, 9, we're averaging around 10 percent. Southeast scheduling services much lower, weather reports lower. <coughs> Calendar schedule, 
One thing I pull out a calendar schedule, I tell my guys is, we've, I've, I've ran into a bunch of guys that have problems with running multiple systems off of one particular well. So they talk about conflict, how they can't schedule because, hey, I just, this is what I have to do. Well, my, my point to them on a calendar schedule is right now, or maybe two months ago, whenever you're picking varieties and picking crops and rotations, if you have the ability to adjust, don't put corn under all three of the systems that are competing for each other. Or don't, in a case I ran into, I had a guy that had watermelons and corn under a system. All of them were hitting peak demand at one time, and he couldn't keep up. So he was, he was in a world of hurt because he had them all there. I, I don't think <coughs> after that year he never did that again. He learned a hard lesson. And I said, if all else fails, do what very few people do and just do what your neighbor does, right? How many of y'all from Mississippi could tell me why that's potentially higher in the Mid-South? Is, does it have to do with furrow irrigation, perhaps, maybe? I don't know. I was just kind of curious. Um, here's our car, corn water use curve. It goes uh, pretty similar to what Tommy presented. We get up, uh, we estimate we get up to about 2.4, basically, inches per week at peak demand right there. Taper back off and terminate around black layer. So, critical period in here. You're looking at two inches, um, two inches per week two and a half inches per week if you account for efficiency of the system. Your, your irrigation system has to meet those demands. So, I just thought this was a pretty neat slide <coughs> to show on irrigation responses. There's center pivot. Tommy showed that in the graph. I've got graphs that show that. We just don't do a very good job affecting much deeper than eight to 12 inches with irrigation from center pivot. We just don't get the soil moisture down there from it. So if we ever lose this dry moisture, as he talked about, we're not going to get it back. We've got to make sure we keep that there. Subsurface drip, we've got that wetting front moving from the drip tape out. And of course, furrow irrigation, we've got a much bigger wetting front as we flow down those furrows. So, um, the title of my talk, so I need to cover that really quick, was um, somebody, I, I can't remember who asked me to do corn irrigation on it. Um, but uh, that's what I was asked to do. And um, that's what I'm going to cover. So we've been running corn irrigation studies by population since 2015. Uh, we've looked at four populations here. These are all planted on 36-inch rows. Um, so you can imagine what 54,000 looks like on 36-inch rows. You can barely get two fingers between the plants. Um, we're getting uh, decently respectable yields, I would say, depending on what we're looking at. Two different irrigation methods. Uh, there are two different sites. So there's just the checkbook method. And here's utilizing sensors. And what I want you to pay attention to, and I've got some graphs and stuff on here in a minute if we've got time. Um, as we go up in population here, and, and here, we don't necessarily, we see a slight increase in yield till we get around the, the about 40 to 50,000. You see we top out at about 320 there. We look over here, the site's just not been as productive over the past three or four years as this site. But what I notice when I look at it is I see a, a continuous increase Nothing extremely significant, but a continuous increase in the water that we've applied via sensor as we move up to 40,000. Once we hit 54,000, I either see a level or a drop in that amount of water. So that was 15. We had, there's our rainfalls, 15.3 and 21.8. Um, here's 16. So 16 was a very similar trend um, up till about, you now we did hit our highest yields here at 54,000. Um, not a whole lot higher than these, and we're in the process of running statistics right now over all this large data set, so I apologize for not having statistics on here. But uh, we look at the other site where we did it via sensors. I see the same trend. There is obviously a difference in water use between uh, conventional and uh, conservation tillage that we have here. But there's 14 and 8, or 14 and 9, 11, 13, 9, 14, and then we drop back down to 8 and 10 when we get to 54,000. So I've been scratching my head on why that's happening. Um, while we're dropping back down, we get to higher populations. Um, let's look at some graphs for a minute. So what I showed here is soil water tension from the watermark sensors that uh, Tommy showed. Just our interface that we've got in-house. We've just inverted the scale. So as you go up, and naturally you can see by colors that you dry out. And uh, down, we try to trigger around 35 on corn. Uh, 30 to 35 is where our trigger point was at. So you can kind of look and see. What's happening in our field, this is, I've got it broken out by population. There's 28,000, there's 34,000. So immediately you can see we're using more water at 34,000. We're driving that curve up a little bit higher. Um, another thing I want to point out on both of the curves, if you notice, you notice that deeper sensor, 24 inches. We see little to no change in that sensor. We see some in events like this. And so what's happening is our irrigation events in here, same way with the higher population, have no effect at that 24 inch sensor. We're having zero effect down that deep until we get a rainfall and then we're actually re-wetting that sensor 
and we see uh, crop water use again in a re-wetting. So I um, thought that was pretty neat across you know both states and where irrigation specialists I talked to, we see that in a lot of different places. Um, there's 40 and 54,000. So at 40,000, we do see a more rapid water use. If you go back and compare it to these, um, these graphs, it kind of dries out a little faster, more water use down at those deeper sensors. Um, similar to 54, uh, we seem, I see that we're getting more water use here at the 16 inch sensor in 54. So, um, you know, we're looking, I have the same threshold set on all of those, but um, we do, I see a lot more response to the 16 inch sensor in the 54 than I did in any of the others. I mean, we might have a higher root density there from those crops a little deeper. Um, this is a checkbook irrigation, so this was sensor based. This is checkbook. So we're extremely conservative on my checkbook, if you, if you couldn't tell. We kept that at basically, we could grow goldfish in that, as you, as you stated earlier, we could grow goldfish in that field, um, independent of population. So this one stayed at saturation. You do see that from the 28th to the 34, it's all in the same field, irrigated the same. We are using more water, we're drying out more rapidly with a higher population here. Um, similar story here, we are a little drier and use a little more water at the uh, 40 and the 54 than we are the 28. So we're, we're not seeing a lot of difference between 34, 40, and 54, but um, we were between the 28 and those two when we were irrigating exactly the same. So um, 2017, very similar story if we go through and look. There's dry land yield. We had dry land treatment that year. Um, not as good of a corn, uh, corn year in Georgia if you look at our yields. Um, we did everything else the same. But I do see the same trend. We kind of ramp up our water requirements until we get to about 40,000 and then we see about a, a one or two inch drop once we get to the 54,000. Just didn't require as much water there. So um, by again, I state by sensor trigger. So um, look at the graphs again. We got about a minute, so I'm gonna skip on through those. I mean, you see similar trends, how we have more drastic water use, more drastic drying as we move up in populations. So, um, and again, little to no effect at that deeper, deeper depth. There's a checkbook again, looks very similar as what it did in 2016. Um, Acknowledgements for it. And with that, um, if you've got any questions, uh, I'm open to it. We have a Facebook and a um, Twitter page if you'd like to follow any of the stuff we do. We try to post all the stuff up there. Both of them are at Georgia Precision Ag. If you search that on either one of them, you'll find us. So we, we have like one minute if you've got a question for Tommy or I, either one. He's got to pass out the rain gauge real quick if y'all get out of the rain. Would, would you still use 35 centibars as your trigger on silt loans? No, I don't think so. I'm not familiar with it. I think you're going to be much higher. So we're on a very sandy lawn. Do you, do you know off the top of your head on a silt lawn? Stress in, stress in Arkansas would be 124. That would be stress, right? Stress. So, yeah. 70, 80, 75 to 80. Yeah, so that's the one difference is we're on a much sandier soil, so we keep that threshold so much lower than y'all. What's the investment? Technology in the data. Okay. So the cheapest company that we have is a company out of Atlanta, Georgia. They cost about three to four hundred dollars for a base station, and then about the same per sensor node out in the field. And um, there's about a ten dollar a month fee associated with that. So um, to one of Tommy's points, I guess one thing you have to think about when you're looking at some of these really variable fields. You need to make a decision if you want one or more sensors out there because his very valid point that he made was if you put a sensor, you put one sensor out there and you put it in a bad spot, you really shot yourself in the foot. And, and even in research trials on station where we've got multiple sensors, I'm sure you've seen it too, always have a bad one out there somewhere no matter how good we try to do. So we push to try to put out multiple sensors, but I know there's a cost associated with that. So with that system, though, to back up and tell you, that system is going to cost you about eight or $900 to get started. That base station works line of sight. Here out here in the Delta, it's going to work a lot better than it does around us. Some we got, you know, a lot of tree lines, more elevation. You'd think as long as you get line of sight to those sensors, you could cover multiple fields and multiple sensors. But again, about $400 per site is the cheapest I have. Um, I don't know. Are y'all going into cost or anything in the roundtable this afternoon? Uh, I don't know. In the open, you know, okay. the, the blue pro, you just put one sensor on. Right? The way right. kind of that, that well, you're right. You'll walk around and check it. How much does that one?